Let me tell you about an article I read a number of years ago. It was in the American business magazine, Fortune. And the editor of Fortune sent a team of their reporters around the world to find Americans who were working temporarily for multinational corporations in other places far from their homeland. And they talked to American businessmen and women in places as diverse as Singapore and Moscow and Riyadh and Buenos Aires. And it was quite eye-opening and illuminating. I, I cut the article out and tucked it away because I found it interesting and worth pondering. And then I rediscovered it in a file not that long ago. And thought, hmm, this might be interesting to share with you. So let me tell you what the article discovered. As these reporters talked to Americans who were scattered all around the world, they posed to them the question, what has the experience been like for you living and working in a very different place and culture? And the responses all tended to express similar themes. Here is what those expatriates, those Americans living in other places had to say about the experience. First of all, there were a number of positives. Oh, I've learned other cultures. I've, I've learned how to communicate in another language. I've, I've seen the world in different ways. I've seen amazing places. My vision and my perspective has expanded. Then there were negatives such as living and working in countries with perhaps corrupt governments or a corrupt uh, system or laws that are not fair or having to deal with uh, people who have unwritten rules of communication that nobody bothered to tell those Americans about. You know, you're not supposed to say this or do that or you should do this in a social situation. Well, oops, all kinds of faux pas. That was part of the negative experience of being in a very different culture. Nearly every one of them felt that the experience of living and working in a vastly different place would further their career eventually, that it, they would be better managers, better leaders, better marketers, whatever their task was, and that by adapting, they gained skill. But there was one other almost universal refrain. In addition to all the positives and all the negatives and all the career advancement opportunities they gained, almost every single one of them said, there are times when I miss home. <laughs> there are times when I wish I could be back in the US of A, in my own culture and my own people. No matter how wonderful the experience, I'm a little homesick. I miss it. Now, I think we can all relate. This is a natural experience. In this room, filled with more than a thousand people, we have a lot of folks among us today who have done some significant travel and have experienced life in other cultures and other parts of this uh, vast and complex and diversified world. And some of you have not just traveled and landed in another place for a little while, but you've really immersed yourself in other cultures. Travel like that is very intense. And I'm not talking about the uh, sort of the bubble travel that we sometimes do. You know, you board a massive cruise ship with 7,000 of your closest friends and you, in comfort of your stateroom and all the amenities, you come to some distant exotic port and you leave the safety of the ship for a few hours and you go into another place and you dip your toe in that other culture and then you pull it back and you're back in the safety of the ship by dinner time. That, that may be a very enjoyable vacation, but you're not really experiencing, you're not really traveling in the sense of, of interacting with other people and learning from them. So I'm talking to those of you who have lived for a period of time or really immersed yourself in other cultures and my guess is that wherever you've been and however that experience was, there have been times for you when you wanted to echo Dorothy at the end of The Wizard of Oz who said, 
there's no place like home. Haven't you felt that sometimes when you've been far away? Of course, it's natural. It's the way we humans are. Not just Americans, but people of all cultures have a certain wiring inside of us that says, though I may enjoy being in other places, there's no place like home. Well, I now am going to lead us in an encounter with a passage from the Word of God that may just have some relevance to us. And I invite you to follow along as Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Words will be on the screens. It's also printed on the back of your first things first, tucked inside your bulletin. There's also a little space there if you'd like to jot down a few notes to remember anything that, uh, that God says to you today. But we're going to encounter these words written by the great apostle Paul. And let's see what he has to say to us. Colossians chapter 3. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth, for you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. Now these are actually quite stunning words. Paul is speaking to every single one of us here who has received Christ as your savior. If you are a Christian, if, if you have acknowledged him to be your Lord, according to this passage of the word of God, something profound has changed in you you are now with Christ. He is in you and you are in him. You belong to God in a way that nothing can take away ever. You are his. You are a part of God's family. And that is a reality that has already happened. Never to be undone. In fact, if you look carefully, the verbs, the tense of these verbs is all past. You are now belonging to Christ. It's done. It's happened. I know that you may feel, because there are certainly times when I feel as well, oh, I'm not any different. I don't feel new. I don't feel special. I'm stuck with my same old personality and my same old habits and my same old ruts and my same old flaws and temptations. But whenever you or I feel that way, we are forgetting what the Bible says, that in God's eyes, we are, we are new in him. We are raised to a spiritual life that will never end. We belong to Christ now and forever. And that gives us a sense of security that nothing can take away. And because of that, the things we sometimes get caught up in and consumed by, the earthly, worldly things, which we know won't last, are not our real self. They're not the things we ought to be ultimately concerned about. And even this world is not our home. Where does Paul say Christ our Lord is? In heaven. Where's heaven? You don't find it on a map. You don't find it on any map of the universe because it's not a place. It's a, a dimension. It's an experience. It's, it's the full presence of the unlimited, infinite God himself. And though we can barely even imagine or grasp what it might mean, the universal repeated promise of the Bible is that there's a part of you and me that can live forever in that spiritual condition when these bodies on this fragile and fallible and departing earth are all gone. We, the real self, will be with Christ forever. And therefore, it is accurate to say that in a spiritual sense, you and I are expatriates. We are living for a while in a place that's not our true home. We are here temporarily, but deep within us is a longing, 
a homesickness even for that true home that awaits us. Do you get the connection? That's what Paul is saying here in Colossians 3, that we are temporarily here on earth, but our homeland is heaven and there's a part of us that is longing for it. So let me take you back to that article in the business magazine and uh, the follow-up question that the reporters asked the American expatriates who were experiencing life in far-flung places, the follow-up question to what was the experience like for you, and almost all of them said, I miss home, the follow-up question was, how do you deal with your homesickness? How do you deal with that missing home? And the responses all lined up spontaneously and across a widely scattered uh, sampling, there were essentially four things that were identified that helped expatriates feel connected to their homeland. Here they were, first of all, written words from home. Not just letters and emails, but even American newspapers or American magazines or websites from America that would bring them news and information and perspective from their homeland that otherwise they were without. One guy uh, who was a big baseball fan uh, was working for a couple years in Bangkok. The ties don't give a rip about American baseball. And this guy had no clue, how's my favorite team doing and what are the standings, except when he could get a hold, either online or in print, of an American sports page. Ah, he could keep in touch and that kept him up with his favorite sport. The written words from home were the first way in which people felt a reconnection. Secondly, Long-distance conversations. How good it was, they all said, to be able to talk with somebody, family members, friends, even the home office, and be able not just to get one-way communication, but be able to share and talk about what they were experiencing and going through. Something about the human voice and about being able to connect and being able to be honest and candid with others who understood as a receiving ear on the other end. Oh, that felt so good. Long distance conversations. First, the written word. Second, conversation back home. The third, being with other people from their homeland. It felt so good for these Americans to meet other Americans and be able to connect. It just helped them to feel that they were back at home. Here was one amazing story found uh, tucked into the article. A young, two young Americans were working for different inter multinational companies in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And somehow they met each other or found each other and they formed a fast, deep friendship. And here's what's remarkable. One of them was a graduate of Ohio State and the other a graduate of Michigan. Are you kidding? How could they? But somehow, they felt a connection with each other that far surpassed their rivalry, especially on the third Saturday of November every year. That didn't matter so much because they were from the same homeland. And so they wanted to be together and their differences were uh, insignificant compared to what they shared. The being with other people. In fact, some of the consulates and embassies in these far-flung cities would actually host uh, wine and cheese parties or cocktail hours once a month and invite the American businessmen and women who were in that area to just come together simply to be with others from the homeland. Oh, it felt so good. And then there was a fourth thing. This might surprise you. The fourth way that expatriates could feel connected to home was to enjoy a meal from home. Some good old American food. There is something powerful about the taste buds. Actually, tastes get in, us in touch with memories. There are comfort foods for you that when you taste them, take you back to some time or some place. And sure enough, those people far away from home who were, we, were eating very different diets found 
a longing for the taste of home. Why one uh, guy who was working in Shanghai shared that uh, he made it a point every week, uh, even though it was out of his way, of taking the, the subway to the closest McDonald's he had located, where once a week he could enjoy a real cheeseburger and fries. It just felt so good. Well, isn't that interesting that those four things were most helpful to people who were homesick and wanted to feel attached to their true home? And now I'm going to connect a bridge for you to God's purposes for us as spiritual expatriates who feel inside a longing for our true home even though we are here for a while in another place as sojourners on earth. And how do we connect to our home and our Heavenly Father? He provides these four ways. First of all, written words from home. That's what this book is. These are words from God, our Heavenly Father, written to us. That's why every time we get together, we spend some time reading them to be inspired and renewed to keep in touch, to get our perspective right and consistent with our heavenly homeland. And many of us feel led to read this book many times between Sundays as well because it just speaks to us of our true home and connects us with our heavenly father. Well, number one then would be written words. Number two would be long distance conversations, which is what prayer is. It is talking to God, our Heavenly Father, who is always 24-7, wherever we happen to be, eager to hear our prayers and to connect with us. And let me make it clear that prayer is not just reciting the daily shopping list. Okay, God, I want this and that and that and that. Amen. Real prayer is meant to be a conversation and communication with our Heavenly Father that gives us the freedom to share everything we're thinking and feeling, everything that's going on, to talk with God about what we're worried about, to express what we're grateful and thankful for, to offer our love and affection to Him, to seek His help and strength, to resist temptation and to choose wisely to do the right thing. Prayer, when properly experienced, is a full communication with our Heavenly Father. It's a long distance phone call that can make a huge difference in our daily lives, connecting us to our home. And then the third, of course, being with others from our homeland. Why do we swing open our doors every week and invite you to come and be with one another? Because we have this need to be with other people from our homeland, other believers who get it, who understand, who have that same Heavenly Father, thus making us brothers and sisters with each other, and we love to get together on Sundays and other times because Christian fellowship, being with other believers, building friendships with people who share our values and and who understand what matters to us, that is so enriching to us. And then the fourth, a meal from home. That's what this is. This sacrament is a brilliant decision by our Savior to utilize the power of the human sense of taste by providing to us a sacred meal from our true home, the taste and the reminder of who he is and where we're from and where we're headed can be a powerful encouragement to us. Just as Americans long for a taste of burgers and fries, so we as Christians have a deep longing to be connected with our home through this sacred meal that in just a moment we'll be able to share in together. So that's what we learn from Colossians chapter 3. That we're here for a little while, our real home is awaiting us. And when it's his time, God will call us back home from our temporary assignment and we will be reunited forever in the place that we were created for. Until then, we have moments like today when we can share in this meal from home together. And as we distribute the elements of the bread and the cup, You can think about whatever you'd like. We'll have a few minutes of quiet and reflection, but I'll suggest to you that this might be a good time to be reminded, to remember 
what Christ did for you and what a difference it makes for your, this world and your eternity. Or it might be a good time for you to reconnect with God by talking with him personally and intimately about something going on in your life. However you choose to use this time, enjoy this, my friends. It's a gift. It's a meal from home. And it will help us connect with our Heavenly Father. Let's bow our heads for a moment in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for providing this as a regular opportunity to remember and be renewed in our faith. And so bless this time that we share in together, for we pray it in Christ's name. Amen.